everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. Um, as you all know, this is Dr. Demi speaking. Um, I am back here again with another video on the workbook. So for those of you who have gotten the workbook on Gumroad or on Amazon, um, I hope you have started working through the problems as a kind of revision. So this is just a video to show you what the solutions are. Um, and so you can check your answers against these and also like start a conversation in the comments if you feel like there is something that wasn't covered or you answered your question a different way and you just want to be on the safe side and be sure that you have done the right thing. Uh, but for those of you who have exams coming up very soon, I assume there's some of you writing in February, March. So if you've started, good luck. I hope your exams go well. For those of you who will be writing in May, June, I hope you have started preparing. Um, I know you'll probably have your mock exam soon and then it is um, go go for you to just um, write the full exam. So I hope all of that goes well. This is going to be a very short video because again, I am not going to go into a lot of detail because all of these things have been covered in the channel video. So if you go to playlist, you can watch the videos by chapter. Um, and you can also see solutions to past papers for those who keep asking um, to do it. Um, like say people are asking me to do a paper three. There are already videos on paper three um, as well as other papers that you can check out just um, so you see how I answer questions. Um, you have a lot of definitions that you have to work out because a lot of chapter four is really just understanding how the cell works and especially the cell membrane. So there are a lot of definitions and these definitions are useful because they can help you answer tricky questions and that's why I put them in the workbook. Um, so for example, um, the first section I asked you to define phospholipids, cholesterol, um, glycoproteins and glycolipids as well as transport proteins. Um, so the thing with phospholipids I believe a lot of you already know is that they regulate the entry and exit of molecules into and out of the cell. What you need to specify in this case is that polar molecules, um, and that's what I've put here, so I'm just going to use a black pen today. Um, polar molecules are the ones that are mostly prevented from entering directly through the membrane. Um, I'm not cancelling that out. For some reason, my pen just acts funny whenever I'm doing my YouTube videos. Um, but you're really looking at polar molecules. So things like glucose, for example, cannot simply pass through the cell membrane. Um, they need to be carried through a transport protein because they are hydrophilic. So basically the idea that hydrophilic molecules cannot simply pass through the membrane. And if you think about it this way, um, I'm just going to, I'm trying to find some room to draw a phospholipid bilayer here. Um, so I'll just draw like a small, small phospholipid bilayer. I'm not going to draw a lot of them, but so let's assume this is inside the cell on the upper part and this is outside the cell. If a polar molecule is coming in from here, it would get past this phospholipid head, but it would not be able to get past the tails where the tails are meeting um, because the tails are hydrophobic, so they would reject that molecule. It's like trying to get a molecule of water to travel, to travel through oil. Um, that's most likely not going to work out. So it's the same thing. Also remember that the phospholipids actually give the cell membrane, like the cell membrane is like an oil, right? Um, so they give it like an oil shaped texture or like an oil fill sort of. So don't think of it as a solid fence. It's more like an oily fence. Um, and this oily fence, in addition to helping regulate the flow in and exit of polar molecules, can also play a role in how fluid the membrane is. So if the phospholipid heads um, not the phospholipid heads, if the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipid, so remember a phospholipid has a phosphate head, um, which is hydrophilic, and two um, hydrophobic tails that are made of fatty acid. If these fatty acids are unsaturated, that means if they have double bonds, the membrane will be more fluid. Okay, um, if they have double bonds, the membrane will be more fluid. If they have less, um, if they don't have a lot of double bonds, then the membrane is less fluid. The idea is to keep the membrane as fluid as possible. So basically an optimal fluid state so that uh, molecules that are required in the membrane can easily flow through. Um, also note that the length of the phospholipid tails can also determine fluidity of the membrane. So those are all the details that I have put here. So you can include these in your answer when you are checking how well you have done. 
Um, with cholesterol, cholesterol is definitely known for regulating fluidity and it plays a role at low temperatures to increase the fluidity of the membrane. So always think of the membrane again as oil, right? If you have like oil, I'm trying to think like maybe something like animal fat, sorry to the vegetarians that might not be familiar with this, or you could even just think of melted butter, for example, if you leave melted butter for a while, um, it will start to solidify again, right? Based on the temperature um, that's in your house. So if it's really warm, but butter will melt. Um, and if it's cold, butter will freeze. Um, so think of the membrane as that. Um, that based on temperature, it can change its state. And what cholesterol does is to ensure that um, that state is always optimal to allow the flow in and exit of materials as they are needed. The glycoproteins and the glycolipids are the ones that you find on the cell surface. And they usually like come out looking like that. Or you can see some of them in the text book with like shapes like that sitting on top of like some of the glam some of the proteins that are in the cell membrane matrix and um, what these do is that they act as surface receptors and those receptors can either be for cell signaling it can be for endocytosis or it can be for cell to cell binding um, and sometimes they also act as cell surface antigens for cell to cell recognition so the best example of this is when we're talking about like blood donations and you always know that certain blood groups cannot receive from certain blood groups because of the different um, antigens that they have on their surface so glycoproteins and glycolipids are the ones that are responsible for that you also have your transport proteins and what transport proteins basically do is that they provide channels or passages for hydrophilic molecules as well as ions to enter the cell. So remember when I said glucose cannot simply flow through the cell membrane, um, it has to go through a transport protein in order for it to get inside the cell. Otherwise, it would be rejected by the cell and obviously without glucose, we would stop functioning. Then I asked you a question here about the cell signaling process. And again, I have just made this as simple as possible. I will not go into detail. If you want the details, please just go on the channel, click on playlist and um, from playlist to just select chapter 4.1. I think I did two chapters on, four, on chapter four. So there's 4.1 and 4.2. And this process is outlined there. But the process is basically that one cell um, will send a signal to another cell in the form of a ligand. A ligand is just a small molecule. That's what it is. So it's something like that. So if you assume this is cell number A, cell number A sends this out and this is supposed to go to cell number B. Cell number B comes here and it has a glycoprotein that's seated there and that glycoprotein would simply go in and bind into the surface there. So the glycoprotein um, is the receptor and the this is the ligand, okay? We call this a ligand, that word over there. So the ligand will arrive at the receptor protein and once it binds, it will change the shape of this receptor. And by changing the shape, that pushes a switch in the receptor called the G switch. So imagine that there's something over here that once the shape changes, this turns on. The G switch basically means that the message that is in this ligand has been transmitted into the cell. And what the G switch would do is that it will lead to the release of what we call secondary messengers. So those are messengers that now get the message and now run around with it. So think of it as a village town crier that's going around and saying, okay, there's going to be um, a meeting in the village square this is a very random example by the way but think of that as someone who's going around saying there's going to be a meeting in the town center there's going to be a meeting in the town center and all of you will hear it become people will go around telling other people that there will be a meeting in the town center and what that leads to is basically the message being spread out so you become the secondary messengers and the primary messenger is the first person who was going around saying there'll be a meeting in the town center um, so that is more or less what happens with regards to cell signaling and this is an outline of the process please if you're asked this in the exam do not write that there's a town center and a town crier 
Then I asked you for the definition of different um, movement processes within the cell. So with diffusion, for example, um, from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. What I've also specified here is that um, this definition means that there is movement down a concentration gradient. So I don't want students to be confused because some students are so attached to the first part of the definition that they miss out on one, this, what the second part means. So if you're moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, you're going down a concentration gradient, all right? Osmosis is more or less the same, except osmosis is the movement of water. So osmosis is not the movement of substances. In diffusion, you can have the movement of sugars, salts, ions, whatever it is, can move. Whereas with osmosis, you're simply talking about just water moving. And it's moving from a region of high water concentration. So that's a more dilute solution. So a region of low water concentration, which is a more concentrated solution. And always remember to add that it is moving through a semi-permeable membrane. Um, I think what I wanted to add here was that it can also be defined in terms of water potential, um, which is basically that water potential um, is, is like the possibility of the water moving more or less so that means water moves if you want to define osmosis in terms of water potential you would say water moves from a region of high water potential to a region of low water potential then you have facilitated diffusion and facilitated diffusion is the same thing as diffusion but in this case it requires a channel or a transport protein in order for the substances to move so remember when i mentioned glucose not being able to just stroll into the cell as it would like and having to move through a transport protein or a channel protein that is facilitated diffusion because concentration of glucose on the outside would be higher and glucose would only move into the cell um, where the concentration is lower through a channel protein then we have active transport and just by the way that um, but just by the definition or by the name active means it requires energy so it means you are moving from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration and that takes work because naturally things will concentrate um, substances will move out of a point of higher concentration and not from a point of lower concentration right so for example if you were to put like a drop of color into water you would notice that that color will first of all congregate as a single drop and after a while it will start to flow outwards to where there is no color in the water until the entire bucket or cup of water is fully colored with active transport what we are saying is that rather than that color coming from a single point and concentrating outwards there are molecules that are moving from the region of low concentration towards the single point um, so it's a lot it's a lot of work and you would find this with things like your sodium potassium pumps in your body um, so as you go deeper into biology, that becomes clearer for you. So I don't want to go into that detail. Then you also have endocytosis, which is basically the engulfing of materials in vesicles. Um, and this is one of the processes that we use even in our immune system. Whenever we are invaded by um, a bacterium or any foreign particle, our immune cells also have the ability to engulf that particle and basically swallow it up. And there are two types of endocytosis. We have phagocytosis. I'm not going to write out the whole name i'm just going to write phago which is the engulfing of um the engulfing of uh solid particles and then you also have pinocytosis which is the engulfing of liquid particles right and then you have exocytosis and exocytosis is basically moving substances so rather than engulfing them and taking them in the substances are being released outwards that's exocytosis and one of the places where we have exocytosis is in protein secretion so i've seen questions in the exams where they ask you what kind of movement protein secretion is and it is exocytosis okay so protein secretion is an example of this Um, there. Then I asked you what plasmolysis is and plasmolysis is more or less is basically not more or less is basically the shrinking of the protoplast from the cell wall due to water leaving the cell by osmosis. Please always bear in mind that plasmolysis will always occur only in plant cells. Um, it will also, well, it occurs mostly in plant cells um, and most of the images you'd get would be with plant cells. I can't recall right now as I record this if it also occurs in animal cells, but if you know that, please put it 
in the comments. And then I asked you to identify the different stages of plasmolysis. And I know this is a difficult one because a lot of the time students don't really know like what is happening. Um, and some of the questions you get here don't really ask you to identify. They just ask you to sort of arrange them in sequence. So this would be scattered and then they might ask you to arrange in sequence. So P is a normal cell. Q is what we call incipient plasmolysis, which basically means the plasmolysis is just starting. And the way you can recognize that is the fact that the um, edges of the cell, you can see they're beginning to move away from the cell wall. And then you have evident plasmolysis, which now you can really see the shrinking happening. And this is final or complete plasmolysis, where there is now a lot of water um, that has left the cell. And as a result, the cell components have shrunk. And then I asked you to define these three different types of solutions, hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. Um, and I didn't specify if I wanted you to define a hypotonic cell or isotonic. I did not specify that. And there was a reason for that because you can have a hypotonic solution and not necessarily a hypotonic cell. So these definitions are what we might call relative definitions because they depend on the environment as well as the component you are describing. So a hypotonic solution is one that has a low concentration of solutes compared to its environment. So for example, I might have a cup of water um, that maybe has one spoon of sugar, okay? And then I might have a cell that I want to put into that water. And let's say this cell has an equivalent of five spoons of sugar, okay? So in this case, the cup of water is the hypotonic solution. In other words, it has a low concentration of solutes compared to maybe a cell that's been put inside it and has five cups of sugar. A good way to also think of these definitions or to remember them is to think of what the words mean. So if you think of the word tonic, you can think of it as a mixture of solutes, right? So if, for example, if you take a blood tonic at home as part of your medicine, um, you would maybe like, maybe it has a taste, a sugary taste to it or anything like that. So you can think of tonic as something that means solute. And when we say hypo, we are basically saying it's lower because hyper means it's higher. So if I say you're in a hypo mood today, which by the way is not a word, but let's assume I decided to invent that as a slang and I say, oh, you're in a bit of a hypo mood. I might be saying you're in a bit of a down mood. You know, you're being a party pooper perhaps. Um, so that's a good way to think about it in order to remember. So given that hypo means low, hyper means high. So a hypertonic solution is a solution with a high concentration of solutes compared to its environment. And then isotonic basically means everything is homeostasis. Everything is just sweet and stable. Concentrations are the same on both sides. And then for the last one, I told you to outline the process of protein secretion using this diagram. And the reason why I included this is that, again, I have seen questions perhaps in uh, paper one or paper two where students are often asked about this. Um, and so just the idea is to think of the fact that after proteins are made in the ribosomes, they are sent out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum in vesicles like that. Um, so you can see this is one vesicle there. Um, Oh, well, you have your protein coming in, actually, sorry, from there. That's coming in from the ribosome. And then from here, that's your vesicle going in to the Golgi body. It will merge with the Golgi body and the protein will be modified as it flows through the Golgi body. And once the protein is modified, and that modification would include adding all the groups that should be on the surface of the protein, folding the protein, just ensuring that the protein is functional and ready to be released. After modification, it is then released in another vesicle. That vesicle will bind to the cell membrane. And once it binds to the cell membrane, um, the proteins would be released out of the vesicle into the extracellular environment. So that is all that you need to do here. So this is just it. This is chapter four of the workbook. Um, I'm, I'm working my way through slowly and I'm trying to get this ready before the major exams are done. I should have done all 11 chapters. Um, so please, by all means, nudge me but don't nudge me too much, I beg you, because um, I do get really, really busy. Uh, but nudge me 
every now and again if in the, in two weeks I haven't posted anything. I hope you're finding the workbook helpful. Thank you for those who have rated it five stars on Gumroad. Really appreciate it and I'm glad that a lot of you got access to the workbooks. The price is now back um, but it's cheaper. Um, it started off as a book that was going for £10 but now I have put it as £5 um, so that students can easily afford it because the point is to help you as much as I can. So have a good time everyone and until the next video, goodbye.